Hi, I'm Pastor Paul Marzon, and welcome to our midweek teaching. We're continuing our series of walking through the Bible, as well as our current message series is walking uh, with the cross, or walking to the cross with Jesus. And so the understanding of it's a journey, and as we walk in this journey with Jesus, we understand new concepts and new things, and he's teaching us new things. And one of the things he's teaching us about, and the early disciples about, is this thing called the kingdom. And although we hear that he's out talking about the kingdom, many times we don't quite get our mind around it. It's kind of a difficult concept. And the scripture he tells them is, seek first the kingdom of God above all else. In other words, the kingdom of God should be your first priority, and he will give you everything you need. In other words, for seeking everything we need versus the kingdom, there's going to be a conflict. And he says, so don't be afraid, little flock, for it gives your father great happiness to give you the kingdom. That's what's awesome, is that it's a gift. He gives it to us. We don't have to steal it. We don't have to take it. We don't have to give anything for it. It's a gift to us. And think about it this way. Say you're planning an extended visit to another country or culture. You probably spend some serious time trying to plan for that trip. For example, my wife and I are going to go see um, our daughter, Rebecca, who's going to graduate the end of May with her master's. And she's been in London all year. So we're doing extensive planning, <laughs> more than I like. We're, we're researching airlines and which ones are the cheapest. Somehow I have to fly through Iceland to get there. I have no idea why, <laughs> but Icelandic Air had the cheapest flight. So we stop there, get off a plane, look around and go, hey, Iceland, and then get on another plane, go to the rest of the way to England. But um, the idea is we plan that. And then when we get there, we have you know housing. Unfortunately, Becca can take care of that for most of the time. Then we're taking a train to go visit our friends. We have to book the train and then, you know, on and on and on. And so... When you plan a trip, it's a lot of preparation, right? Um, and some of your common words or gestures are different. So, like, for example, when we go to England, when we say the word boot, we think of our foot or our shoe. The word boot in England, that's your trunk or the back of a car. Um, you know, the you know, first time I was in England, someone asked me for a fag. I went, what? And it's like, they wanted to bum a cigarette from me. And it's just like little things like that, knowing the culture, the customs, the gestures. And you try to do things that wouldn't be an embarrassment. Like when I went to Japan, um, I didn't realize all the things I was doing to embarrass my son. For example, you know, he always took his shoes off at the beginning of going into any building, public or private, and knew that there'd be slippers you could put on. I didn't. I just like walked in or I'd forget, you know, because I was in a hurry. Um, things like that. I didn't lay my chopsticks the right way. <laughs> so he's like, no, oh, no, that's an insult. What, huh? Um, so if you move blindly into a new environment without any prior consideration of what's expected of you, you can get into some serious trouble. Um, and so think about this. Jesus was laying out basic teachings. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. And then he told these parables about the kingdom. And the parables were kind of this way to us to understand more fully what is the kingdom. So, what are some of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven? And others have not, he says. To those who are open to my teaching, my understanding will be given, and they'll have an abundance of knowledge. But to those who are not listening, even what they have will be taken away from them. That is why I tell you these stories, because people see what I do, but they don't really see. They hear what I say, but they don't really hear, and they don't understand. In other words, his parables were kind of the secret code to the kingdom. And according to Jesus, the kingdom of heaven was not some strange mystical realm or off in the distance in the future. Rather, both Jesus and John the Baptist repeat that the kingdom of God is at hand or the kingdom of God is near or the kingdom of God is now, right? And then they use these parables. Here's a few analogies he can. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed and the smallest seed known to first century planters. Yet it's capable of reaching a height of perhaps 15 feet. And he says, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast, and it has this potency to get throughout the whole bread. So the kingdom of heaven is like a hidden treasure in a field. The kingdom of God is like a germinated seed. The kingdom of heaven is like a fisherman's net. Similarly, the kingdom of heaven is like a field where the owner has planted wheat, but an enemy has sneaked in at night and sown weeds among the good seed. So Jesus' disciples claimed to be catching on everything Jesus was saying. But Jesus was like the owner of a storehouse who could pull out new teachings or treasures, as well as old ones. And so consequently, the disciples need occasionally to help these parables to help understand the symbolism of what he was talking about in the kingdom. So he goes on and he talks more and more about this and then the plot thickens. He talks about the vineyard workers and about a landowner went out one morning to the workers and they agreed on a price, a standard age wage, but then everybody that came later in the day, they got paid the same price. In other words, everybody got the same key to the kingdom. And then they're like, well, wait a second, that's not fair. What if we work harder? What if we started earlier? God says, you know what? That's not how the kingdom works. 
everybody is welcome in the kingdom no matter when they join the party. <laughs> and they're like, well, that doesn't seem fair. Um, and then he said he talked about this wedding banquet where the rich and the famous didn't show up, but the poor did. Yep, guess what? They got to come into the wedding banquet too. And then he talks about a talent show where three servants get five talents, one gets two talents, one gets ten, and then they multiply the talents, and some do and some don't, and the one with one talent just keeps it. And he's like, in giving the keys to the kingdom, there's some expectations. One of the expectations is to use the talents I've given you. And then he tells about the unforgiving debtor and that in the kingdom, we need to forgive one another, whether we like it or not. And then he talks about the ten bridesmaids and how they weren't prepared for when Christ came back. And so they missed the, the ride to the kingdom, the new party. Um, so basically, he has all these stories about the kingdom. And what is the kingdom? Well, the kingdom can't be explained fully. That's why he used the parables. But the idea is that it's a relationship with God that is so immediate and so real that when we enter into it, our life is changed from the inside out. We begin to see things differently. We begin to experience things differently. We begin to act differently ourselves and wanting to be a part of the kingdom and act like we're belonging to the kingdom. So, for example, if we're going to a wedding banquet and you're here on earth in a normal society, you don't wear jeans and a t-shirt, right? Unless it's an outdoor wedding and it's a special occasion. You typically dress up. He used that same example to put on wedding garments. In other words, to wear kingdom-like clothing. And so in the same way, we put on a, a certain sense of trying to live out the kingdom life here and now. I have a few questions for you as we're closing about this kingdom mentality. And so if you're in a small group or if you're just reflecting on them yourself, I have a few questions that you can think about. One is, how would you define wealth? I define wealth as a rich relationship with God. But in your opinion, how does one become financially wealthy? How does one become spiritually wealthy? I'll ask those questions again. How would you define wealth? And in your opinion, how does one become financially wealthy or spiritually wealthy? Take a few minutes and uh, discuss that amongst yourselves. Okay, hopefully you had a great conversation about wealth and what is the meaning of wealth. And I want to talk about worry. Jesus said, don't worry about these things, that the tomorrow will take care of itself. He told the lilies of the field are beautiful, and yet they don't have to worry about their clothing. And the birds of the air, right, have enough food to eat. In the same way, why do we worry? So the question I want to ask you is, what is one thing you worry about? You can share that with somebody else. And why does this thing trouble you? What do you worry about? And why does this thing trouble you? Take a few moments to talk amongst yourselves. And so he also discussed in this whole aspect of the kingdom about treasures, about finances, about riches. And he said that it can be a barrier from us experiencing the kingdom. So let me ask you a question. What does it mean when we say we're laying up treasures in heaven? What does it mean to lay up treasures in heaven? In what ways have you done so? In what ways have you laid up treasures in heaven? Let us pray. Holy and loving God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word and to reflect on the kingdom. And Lord, we pray for each and every one that is um, participating in studying your word this year as they read it, as they reflect on it, as they talk about it in small group or as they talk about it with family. Lord, I just pray that you continue to help open their eyes and their hearts and their ears by the power of your Holy Spirit, that they may understand what you're saying with, with them and to them this day. We pray for these things in your name. Amen. Mm -hmm.